we start our discussion proper of bacteriology by, of course, um, starting with one of the most important bacteria, okay, and this pertains to the group of gram-positive bacteria. One of the gram-positive bacteria that we always, almost always encounter would be the Staphylococcus. Okay, so Staphylococcus is actually a group of gram-positive cocci. They are spherical. If you will be looking under the microscope, especially if we stain them with gram stain, this gram-positive cocci, this gram-positive cocci appear okay, in a grape-like cluster. So they appear in a grape-like cluster. So they don't have any capsule. They don't have any spores. Um, they need oxygen for growth, but some of them are actually said to be facultative anaerobic. They are strongly catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that can hydrolyze hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide, which results into rapid effervescence of gas. And then they can ferment glucose. All of them can ferment glucose except for one species, and that would be the Staphylococcus saprophyticus. And then um, the organisms, some of them, some of them appear singly. Okay, so if you if you'll be looking at the microscope, some of them would appear singly. Some of them appears in chain and in pairs, but most of the time, when you speak of Staphylococcus aureus, okay, they appear in grape-like cluster. So this is actually the the grape-like cluster is actually the easiest way to describe um, Staphylococcus aureus or not necessary aureus but the staphylococcus species if you will be uh, if you'll be culturing them in 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 agar okay so they appear to be creamy it is as if you place butter on top of your agar so that's how they look they appear to be creamier creamy white or very rare light gold and some species are actually said to be beta hemolytic so, what do we mean by the word beta? Beta hemolysis. Okay. Hemolysis refers to, hemo refers to the red cell, and then lysis refers to the destruction of red cell. There are actually three types of hemolysis. We have the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. Okay. It says here that Staphylococcus, particularly Staphylococcus aureus, is beta hemolysis. What does it mean? It means that there is a complete hemolysis. Okay? So, beta hemolysis means complete hemolysis. Which means that if, if the red agar plate, of uh, the blood, I'm sorry, blood agar plate is... So, let's say for example, this is the blood agar plate. Blood agar plate is supposed to be what? Red, right? So, this is the blood agar plate. Okay. If this is the... Blood agar plate... Uh, and then okay. and then there would be colonies of Staphylococcus let's say this is the colony of Staphylococcus what will usually happen is that beside the colonies of Staphylococcus um, there would be colorless streak why colorless? because it means that the red cells have been completely destroyed. Because when you say complete hemolysis, 
that refers to that refers to uh, beta hemolysis that refers to complete hemolysis unlike when you say alpha alpha hemolysis refers to incomplete hemolysis so instead of having instead of having a colorless streak okay so the, the surface of the blood dagger plate becomes greenish brown when you say gamma hemolysis it means that there is no hemolysis so there is no hemolysis so that's gamma hemolysis okay now for general characteristics I did mention to this to you a while ago they don't have flagella they don't have spores they don't have capsule they are aerobic except for one species and that would be Staphylococcus saccharolyticus but they are not part of the, this is this species is not part of the medically important species of Staphylococcus so again this is the morphology of the Staphylococcus aureus so as you can see some of them are arranged by pairs some of them appear as an individual entity but most of the time they appear in a grape like cluster so that would be the this these are the basic morphologic characteristics of staphylococcus um my cococcus is another example before we discuss um the the most imp important species of staphylococcus um there's one group of organism that is related to Staphylococcus, especially in terms of morphological appearance. And this is the Micrococcus luteus. Why related? Because Micrococcus luteus, for one, is also a gram-positive cocci. They are also a catalyst-positive organism. But, unlike Staphylococcus aureus, unlike Staphylococcus aureus, Micrococcus is coagulase negative. So, this is a coagulase negative organism. What is a coagulase? Coagulase is an enzyme that can cause gel formation of plasma. So, later on, I'll, tell, I'll show you how to do a coagulase test and what, um, what is the appearance of the plasma once the organism is coagulase positive. So, one of the most important characteristics of of Micrococcus is the distinct pink, uh, the distinct yellow pigmented colony. So, if you will look closely, you'll be able to see the distinguished yellow colonies of of Micrococcus uh, uh, as it, uh, when it appears at the surface of the blood agar plate. So, Micrococcus luteus is generally considered non-pathogen so they are not as harmful as staphylococcus okay so what are the medically important species of staphylococcus i did mention to you that there are actually three medically important species of staphylococcus the first one in our list is staphylococcus aureus do you know why it's called aureus okay the word aureus came from the Latin word which means aurea and this refers to gold. Okay, so where do we usually find Staphylococcus aureus? Believe it or not, most of the time we can find them, we can find them at the anterior nerves. Which means, yung mahilig mangulangot sa inyo. Okay? Shout out sa mga mahilig mangulangot. Okay? Uh, kawaii naman yung mga mahilig mangulangot. Okay, so which means, if you do that, most of the time, you have Staphylococcus aureus in your hands. And then, after mangulangot, shake hands with your classmate, pag appear ka, that's one way of transmitting it. Okay. So, it's 
a primary pathogen. So the most pathogenic species of Staphylococcus okay, is Staphylococcus aureus. Um, they are capable of producing superficial to systemic infections, which means that Staphylococcus aureus could cause infection that would infect your skin or it could be as worse as bacterial sepsis. So when you say bacterial sepsis, it means that the bacteria are constantly multiplying in the blood. They are actively multiplying in the blood. So that's the basic difference with sepsis and bacteremia. Okay, so aside from S or U's, we also have Epiderm S. epidermidis as a clinically important species and Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Okay, so we'll be discussing them later on. Anyway, let's concentrate now on Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, how do we get Staphylococcus aureus? There are different ways. Um, it could be due to traumatic introduction. Let's say, for example, you perform vani puncture, skin puncture, without applying any antiseptics to your patient. That could be one. And then, destruction of skin layers, such as burns. Okay? So, burns. Do you know that the number one leading cause of burn infection is Staphylococcus aureus? It is only followed by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But the number one leading cause of burn infection is Staphylococcus aureus or as a result of medical procedure. So that's the reason why um, whenever we have a traumatic, uh, I mean invasive procedure to the patient, okay, then we have to, we have to perform a septic technique. That is you want to have or to prevent transmission of Staphylococcus. Okay, now the organism is ubiquitous. What, what, what do I mean when I say ubiquitous? This organism is constantly present in the skin. Almost always present in the skin. So, but not everyone is always infected or will show any signs of being infected. Which means that for some people, there are predisposing factors. There are predisposing factors that would make them more at risk of getting infected. One of the predisposing factors would be having chronic infections. Some staphylococcus may serve as a co-infection or as a result of secondary bacterial infection. Let's say for example, for those people with elephantiasis, diba? I told you the scenario, so most of the time, the, the swollen lower extremity the swollen scrotum may be, uh, uh, you, there's a chance that there could be wounds in that area. So the wound, if not properly taken care of, could be contaminated or infected with Staphylococcus aureus in dwelling devices, such as catheter, skin injuries, such as burn, or if you are immunocompromised, you have a weak immune system, so, these organisms may take advantage of that situation. So, there are, uh, generally speaking, Staphylococcus is supposed to be a golden yellow pigment. But there are varieties. Some of them would produce lemon yellow pigment. So, an example of that would be Staphylococcus citreus. And then, Staphylococcus albus produces um, porcelain white pigment. So, Staphylococcus aureus, um, since they are buttery, it is as if you have a butter at the surface of your agar, so some of them may have oil paint appearance. Now, if you're using manitol salt agar, or the MSA, are you familiar? Okay. Staphylococcus aureus will have a golden yellow pigment. Why golden yellow? Uh, primarily because 
Your mannitol salt agar has phenol red as an indicator. Okay? And once the mannitol is fermented, the mannitol becomes acidic. And if the, if the medium is acidic, the phenol red indicator will turn yellow. Okay. In potassium telluride medium, Staphylococcus aureus produces jet black colonies. And in blood other plate, they, will, they, uh, they are characterized by beta hemolysis. Again, this means complete hemolysis. So, this is a coagulase test. Coagulase is an enzyme that can produce clots in the plasma. Which means if the organism produces, produces uh, coagulase, this will make their plasma uh, to appear like a gel. So that's a positive result in coagulase test. So, Staphylococcus aureus, remember this one, is the only human species that could result into a coagulase positive specimen. But for non-human species, okay, Staphylococcus delphini, Intermedius, Hayekush, and Schleiferi, these are animal pathogens and they are also capable of producing, producing coagulase positive samples. However, since our focus here would be um, medical bacteriology that of primarily important to humans, we will just be concentrating on Staphylococcus aureus. Coagulase negative Staphylococci includes Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Interestingly, Staphylococcus epidermidis is, is an example of hospital acquired infection. So when you say hospital acquired infection, we are referring to nosocomial infection as a result of hospital stay. Well, but again, Staphylococcus aureus is the number one cause of nosocomial infection. But epidermidis is also an example of bacteria that are capable of causing nosocomial infection. And then, Staphylococcus saprophyticus is usually could cause urinary tract infection in sexually active young females. So, that's why if your sample is a urine, one of the things that you should be considering would be saprophyticus. Later on, there is actually an algorithm on how you'll be able to differentiate the three species. Okay. So, what are the virulence factors of Staphylococcus aureus? One of them is enterotoxins. Enterotoxins are very important since they are heat stable, exotoxin, and they are capable of causing diarrhea and vomit. Um, this is one of the most common causes of food poisoning. So we have the so-called staphylococcal food poisoning, and one of them would be enterotoxin. Are you familiar with the things that happen in Davao? The durian can be get contaminated. Well, DOH had actually released the results of the investigation and they told us that it is caused by staph aureus. How does it happen? Well, primarily speaking, this happens when you prepare food, when you prepare food um, unhygienically. The most common cause of this is when you prepare spaghetti. In, during Christmas party, for example, so, what usually happens is that you prepare, let's say, uh, your group, uh, uh, you are assigned to prepare spaghetti for the afternoon party. So, when you prepare food, you didn't wash your hands. Well, normally speaking, they are in your hands. Right? They are in your hands. And then, you prepare food, the food got contaminated, 
and then you allow food to stand in room temperature without refrigeration. So, during the time when the food is in room temperature, the organism keeps on dividing. They divide, divide, divide. And in doing so, they produce enterotoxin. Now, the enterotoxin that they produce are heat stable. So, you might say to me, Oh, it's okay, we will heat the food before we serve it. Okay, do that. If you heat the food before you serve it, the organisms will die, correct? Since they don't have spores, they will die. But, what will remain after you have reheated the food is what? Enterotoxins. Okay? And this enterotoxin is the one that can cause food poisoning. Okay? Clear? That's why, let's say for example, um, are familiar with microwavables. There are lots of them, right? Um, or frozen bamboos, frozen meat, right? They say, do not reto. Anong ibig sabihin ng do not reto? So, they are frozen, and then you have to tow them, right? And then, when you say tow, you have to let it sit in room temperature. And then, after it has been towed, then you have to cook it. But for some people, they keep on retowing food. Why? Why are not, you're not supposed to do that? Because if you allow it to sit at room temperature, what will happen is there's a great chance Especially if you're using, if you're using contaminated hands or it got contaminated, there's a great chance that the food or the bacteria will multiply. And then, once they multiply, and then you place back again the food in the refrigerator, you preserve them. They won't die. And then, once they multiply, they have already produced enterotoxin. Agree? And then, the next time that you hit the food, bacteria will die, but the enterotoxin remains. Probably that's what happened when they prepared durian. Diba when they prepared durian? They have to use their hand, wrap it in the candy. Diba? I don't know. Have you seen a durian candy? Diba? They are being wrapped in a cellophane. So, They wrap, and then when they wrap, when they wrap the candy, some of them nangolangot, some of them didn't wash their hands, and then they place the candy room temperature. Bacteria have already multiplied. Bacteria have already multiplied, and then enterotoxins were produced. So the next time, the next time uh, you'll eat that candy, okay. So, you'll have the food poisoning. Okay. Yeah, pastillas, yema. If prepared unhygienically, that could also happen. Thank you for reminding that to us, Naomi. So, that pastillas. Yeah. Because pastillas, it's, it's actually a good culture media for staphylococcus, very rich in carbohydrates. Staphylococcus can ferment glucose. <laughs> okay. Um, there are several so, there are several toxins that could be implicated in food poisoning. So the uh, enter, that's what you call enterotoxin. But aside from enterotoxin, there are other toxins. Toxins A, B, C, D, E and GHI, about eight of them. And they can, they are resistant to gastric acid. If you ingest staphylococcus or use through a vehicle, you can also, they will survive gastric juice. The toxins could survive the gastric juice. Okay. So, B, C, G, and I are associated with toxic shock. Which means that once toxin has happened, your blood pressure will drop significantly. So that's what you call toxic shock. Okay? Toxin L 
toxin F, or this is otherwise known as the toxic toxic shock syndrome toxin one. Okay, um, this is being produced by a fudge. What is a fudge? A fudge is a is a virus that could infect bacteria. So what will happen is that the bacteria fudge will carry a gene and this gene will be inserted into the bacteria. Okay? So the gene will allow the, part, the organism to produce the toxic shock syndrome toxin 1. And they can, they can cause significant damage to our immune system. So that's why they are called as the super antigens. So these are toxin, to, toxin F, toxin B, C, G, and I. So they are the super antigens. Another type of toxin. So, C, no? Staphylococcus aureus can produce several toxins. So another type of toxin is the exfoliative toxin. Okay. So, what? if you hear the word exfoliate, What's the first thing that comes into your mind? Huh? Yes, your skin gets exfoliated or peeling of the skin. So, this toxin can cause peeling of the skin. Even if you're not applying as stringent as many of you are, but <clears throat> but this organism can cause peeling of the skin. And it's not just an ordinary peeling, but the peeling is actually painful peeling. Okay? So, it could cause sloughing of the skin. Okay? So, that's the reason why once you have this toxin, you'll develop the so-called SSSS. Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome. Otherwise known as the Ritter's disease and also associated with Bullus impetigo, exfoliative toxin. Leucosidins is the PVL. Panton Valentine Leucosidin. Do you know why this one is very important for bacteria? But it's our contrabida. Leucosidin is a tox is a virulence factor that could destroy our neutrophils, our PMNs. So, what will usually happen, the neutrophils will attack Staphylococcus aureus. But before it attacks and phagocytize Staphylococcus aureus, what will usually happen is that Staphylococcus aureus will produce leucosidin, and that destroys our WBC, our neutrophil, and our neutrophil will no longer be capable of phagocytizing them. Who loses in the end? Our neutrophil. See? That's how harmful they are. Okay. So, the cytolytic toxins of Staphylococcus aureus, so this include the hemolysis. What do you mean by cytolytic toxin? When you say cytolytic toxin, this toxin can cause lysis of Staphylococcus. They can lyse the bacteria. So it has three main types, alpha, beta, delta. But gamma is not generally important because gamma means no hemolysis. So alpha, incomplete, because it only destroys platelets and tissues. Beta complete hemo hemolysis has an enhanced activity by acting on sphingomyelin. Where can we find the sphingomyelin? <coughs> sphingomyelin is a lipid and it is found at the membrane of our red cell. Okay. Um, beta hemolysin is also known as the hot cold lysine. Why hot cold? Okay, it works best at 37 degrees centigrade and very well when stored at 4 degrees centigrade. Which means that if you are using blood agar plate, 
that you've been keeping in the refrigerator. And then, you strip the organism at the blood other plate, incubate it at 37 degrees. That's the perfect scenario for the Staphylococcus aureus to show beta hemolysis. But that's what usually happen when you have culture media. You store it in the refrigerator and allow it to allow it to incubate at 37 degrees centigrade. Okay. The delta hemolysin, hemolysin can cause injury to cells and leukocytes, but it is not as lethal as the beta hemolysin. Okay. Moving on, we also have the coagulase as part of the virulence factor. Coagulase is more of diagnostic. So later on, we will be discussing the importance of, of the diagnosis, laboratory diagnosis of Staphylococcus. Hyaluronidase um, is also known as the spreading factor. So, hyaluronidase is also known as a spreading factor. Um, it can hydrolyze hyaluronic acid. If you remember histology, or yeah, wala pa kayo sa connective tissue, right? Okay. Um, hyaluronic acid is actually part of the proteoglycans. Okay? And once it lyses the hyaluronic acid in the connective tissues, it will now allow the spread of the infection. So that's the reason why hyaluronidase is the spreading factor. And then the lipase is an enzyme that can hydrolyze lipids. So what will happen is that there would be breakdown of fats and oil in the sebaceous gland of the skin surface. <coughs> so that's why um, if your face is oily, it doesn't matter for Staphylococcus aureus. They could still infect you because of the fact that they have light base, which could break down the sebaceous gland. So, the more oil that you have, the more substrate that is available for the light base of Staphylococcus aureus. That's why they say, Oiliness is next to ugliness. Protein A, um, another example. Protein A, if you remember our discussion in immunology, if this is the antibody, this is the FC portion. Okay? Protein A will bind with the FC portion. Okay, so that the antibodies will not anymore be helpful for will not anymore be helpful for opsonization. So somehow they can prevent phagocytosis. So aside from leukosidine that they produce, imagine Staphylococcus aureus is more powerful than Gatda. Okay. So, so Staphylococcus aureus can produce protein A. So protein A, A binds with the Epsi portion, and the Epsi portion, the Epsi portion will allow the organisms to what? Uh, will allow the organisms to avoid phagocytosis. Sometimes Staphylococcus will even use protein A to mask so that the immune system won't be able to see them. So, they will not be considered as an antigen. Okay. So, in summary, these are some of the examples of the virulence factor. So, we have the coagulase, leucocytine, the, the hemolysine, the protein A, exfolatine, and terotoxin. So, I think... Uh, Ah, yeah. This is an example of alpha hemolysis. Why did I say alpha? Greenish. Greenish brown. You do not look at. You do not look here because this is blood agar plate. 
naturally, it's red. You don't look at the colonies, but you look at the surface beside the colony. Colony will always remain white or battery or yellow, but look at the surface. Okay? So this is greenish brown. So how about this one? This is the colony and this is colorless. Ah, sir, yellow po. No, it's colorless. But, may, nag, nag, they, siguro they use flash. So, it's supposed to be colorless. Okay. You know, cannot really have a perfect colorless appearance because when you photograph, so something will really have, something will flash. But, or the background has a yellow light. I don't know. But it's supposed to be a colorless surface. Beta, gamma, nothing has changed. So that's why it's not important. But it's important for diagnostic purposes. And so alpha, then the beta, and then the gamma. So, where can we find at the anterior nears? Say, okay. other. Axillae, vagina, pharynx, and other skin surfaces. Can cause hospital outbreaks, particularly in the nurseries. You know, but when when personnel in the in the nurseries change diapers, when they change diapers, it's very important that they should wash hands before and after changing the diaper of each child. Because if there's, you're just using one, if you're just, if you're not washing your hands, not using different gloves for each child, there's a chance that when you change the diaper of this child, and this child has exfoliative toxin-producing Staphylococcus aureus, that bacteria could be transferred to the next child. So the, hence, there's what you call nursery outbreaks. Burn units. The leading cause of burn infection is Staphylococcus aureus and of course surgical patients. They're not, if the wounds are not properly taken care of, there's a big chance that it could get contaminated. So there are past formers. What are past? Yes. Past are actually made up of dead WBCs. They can cause firm tail, boils. A painful inflammation of the skin, but not just the skin, but also the subcutaneous tissue. Carbocles have much deeper, and farocles is one pizza, carbocles several pizza, and it's much deeper. In fact, if it's a carbocles, it will require surgery because it appears at the deeper tissue. If you want to watch, there's actually a YouTube video that will show you how to remove it. So usually, they will lacerate the skin. But of course, they have to do it aseptically. Lacerate the skin and then squeeze the pus out of the lacerated skin. Bavarian seal. Okay. They can also cause folliculitis. Folliculitis is the infection of the hair follicle. Sometimes you can see pus beside where the hair follicle is supposed to be at. And then they can also cause bullus impetigo. Bullus is characterized by pustules. Okay? Redness, okay, filled with fluids. That's bullus impetigo. Which could also be caused by streptococcus so this is could be spread by direct contact skin to skin or by fomites what do you mean by fomites yes inanimated objects sometimes um, infection occurs due to blood follicles sebaceous glands or sweat glands so if it's blood um, most then there's a dirt because of the black uh, the dirt causes the blocking 
so you'll get uh, that becomes black head or white head so sometimes people will squeeze it and that's how they get contaminated also they get infected so this is an example of folliculitis okay so as you can see so you'll know it's folliculitis because of the past surrounding where the hair follicle like here and then a farangel uh, it's a single draining and large farangel from at the subcutaneous tissue but carbuncles are actually much deeper and this is an example of impetigo Okay. It's a pustule, so there is a fluid, and that fluid that comes out from the pustule is actually uh, is actually uh, infectious. Now boils. Okay. <laughs> um, the SSSS, um, Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome. Um, more likely to occur also in renal failure patients, um, immunocompromised. The severity ranges from being mild to severe. So, mild means you only have localized lesion, but if it's severe, it's expected you have that you have large generalized area with profuse peeling, okay, of the epidermal layer, which could last for about two to four days. If it happens among the adults, it could be fatal because it is always accompanied by renal failure. So here is an example of cases of SSSS. Okay, the Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome. Um, the toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, there are several factors that could have caused it. Uh, drug induced infection the vaccines are not officially known it is similar to SSSS but we can treat patients with steroids unlike SSSS cannot treat patients with steroid but just the same it has a very high mortality rate toxic shock syndrome toxin F right familiar again uh, associated with super absorbent tampons. You know what tampons are? Yes, tampons are being used by females. Yes, uh, usually being used by ballerinas or swimmers that regulates menstrual flow. So that tampons. Of course, I don't think, I, know, I mean, you don't have to tell us, but I don't think anyone is still using tampon nowadays. No, I'm using. Okay, so why tampons? Tampons sometimes can get contaminated with bacteria, and once inserted, that contaminated bacteria, okay, it will cause the bacteria will cause the production of toxins presented by high fever, rashes, watery diarrhea, vomiting or dehydration which leads to hypotension because when you say shock your blood pressure becomes very low and worse this result also to this would also result to BIC or disseminated intervascular coagulation wherein you have thrombosis disseminated small clots or clots disseminated in almost all parts of the body so that's what you call DIC. Your BOM, blood urea nitrogen, and creatinine will also increase. Okay, it could be fatal, but the mortality rate is very low. But it happens if the toxic shock is further complicated to multi-organ system failure. So sometimes it could be caused by diaphragm or tampons. Um, food poisoning, 
toxin is the reason why there's a food poisoning. I think I did mention that to you a while ago. Particularly what? The enterotoxin. But among enterotoxin, A and D would be the most common. Particularly if you are fond of eating mayonnaise-rich food. Yeah, salads. Yeah. Yeah, salads, potato salad. Uh, potatoes. Okay. Inadequate refrigeration because you allow the organism to regrow. To grow. So what will happen? Two to eight hours after ingesting food, uh, you'll feel uh, nause nauseous. And then, start to vomit, you have abdominal pain and cramps. But the good news, if it's a good news, it will resolve within 24 to 48 hours. It's very rare that someone would die from food poisoning due to Staphylococcus. But it's inconvenient to have this one because of the pain and abdominal cramps. So, yeah, salad, bake, bakery products such as fresh cream cakes, mild and dairy products, sandwiches, mayonnaise, meat products such as sliced or even processed meat, meat pies, cured hams, poultry, egg products, cream pies. So these are examples of food that are that could be implicated in food poisoning caused by staphylococcus. So this enterotoxin are heat stable caused by unhygienic preparation of food. So other infections aside from aside from the so-called SSSS, food poisoning, so they can also cause pneumonia. But it's actually secondary after you had viral infection. But it's relatively rare, but even if it's rare, it has a very high mortality rate. It could also cause bacteremia and endocarditis, particularly for intravenous drug users. Okay? Through injection. So if you're an addict, if you're a drug addict, before you, in, you inject drug, so pare, antiseptics first. <laughs> so that you avoid bacteremia or endocarditis. Don't get too excited, pare. Okay, antiseptic first, you know? We do not want to have bacteremia caused by Staphylococcus aureus and stuff like that. Okay. Osteomyelitis. Oh, this one occurs after you have bacteremia. In bacteremia, the organisms are found in the blood. But, there will come a time that from the blood, bacteria will go to the bone. Kilig to the bone talaga to. Kasi, you'll have chills. So, kinikilig ka. And then, fever, swelling, and pain around the infected area. Arthritis if bacteria is found in the joint, so there what uh, this will result in what you call septic arthritis. So septic arthritis is also caused by Staphylococcus. Okay, so aside from obvious, we also have epidermitis, Stas epidermitis. Predominantly a nosocomial infection. You know that we normally have epidermidis in our skin, staph epidermidis in our skin. But once they apply catheter and aseptically, uh, uh, and then heart valves or even CSF shots, these invasive procedures will make the patient more at risk of getting staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay. So, the organism can also produce the slime layer. Slime layer is one of the major virulence factor of staph epidermis. And theories have it that the biofilm produced by staph epidermis is also a result of quorum sensing. 
Familiar again with quorum sensing? What is quorum sensing? It is the... Yes, uh, quorum sensing is when the bacteria express virulence as a result of increase in numbers. So there's a quorum sensing, but they produce biofilm. Biofilms are what? Layers of microorganisms. They could adhere in prosthetic devices such as the catheter, which means that this could also result into UTIs or even stitch abscess. So it's a resident floor of the skin. Unlike staph aureus, staph epidermidis is coagulase negative, but no for biosin sensitive. So you do antibiotic susceptibility testing and there would be a zone of inhibition. So slime factor is the one that could result into the formation of biofilm. So once biofilm is present, they, this could cause stitch abscess. Surgical wound with stitches, staph epidermidis could adhere to that. UTIs, endocarditis, bacteremia, meningitis. So the organism can produce slime that could allow them to adhere in the catheter. Okay. Staphylococcus saprophyticus can cause UTIs, particularly in sexually active young female because of the fact that the organisms could increase, could have increased adherence at the epithelial cell lining. So, it is rarely present in other skin areas or mucous membranes, so usually in genital urinary tract. So, we can, that's why it's very important that we try to isolate them in urine culture, particularly if the doctors are, if the doctor is considering the history of the patient in terms of sexual activities. However, if present in low amount, it is considered, uh, it's still considered significant. So, unlike staph epidermidis, staph saprophyticus is novobiosin resistant. Okay. So, again, okay, in summary, the only one that is coagulase positive is Stas orange, which means if it's coagulase negative, your your only two options among the medically important stuff are either epidermidis or is either epidermidis or saprophyticus. But but how do you differentiate them? You do novobiosin sensitivity testing. If it's sensitive, it's epidermidis. If it's resistant. It's a prophysics. Did you get it? Yes. Okay. So other coagulase negative stuff includes hemolyticus. Stuff hemolyticus. The second most common coagulase negative stuff. Because the most common COMS coagulase negative stuff is epidermidis, followed by hemolyticus. Why second most common? Because this one could be isolated from the wounds, UTI, bacteria, in bacteremia, in cases of bacteremia, and in endocarditis. Recently noted to develop resistance to vancomycin. Wow, this is kind of dangerous because vancomycin is one of the most powerful antibiotics. Opportunistic pathogens include lugdunensis and slavery. Opportunistic means that these bacteria would take advantage of host with weak immune system. So let's talk about the lab diagnosis. So how do we diagnose Staphylococcus? Of course, you do microscopic examination. How many of you have already seen Staph? Staphylococcus under the microscope. Gram stain. You haven't seen? Staphylococcus. Okay. Gram positive cocci that appears in grape like cluster. Sometimes, if, if it's a clinical sample, it could be accompanied by PMMs. Um, clinical samples are usually from purulent exudates, joint fluids, or even aspirated secretions. But aspirated secretion would be the best clinical samples to do microscopic examination because of 
lesser chances of getting contaminated. Particularly if aspiration is done aseptically. So this is how they look like under the microscope. And the slide here is an electron micrograph view of Staphylococcus. They are indeed spherical, perfect sphere. So this is an example of coagulase negative stuff in blood agar plate, ships blood agar. Um, do you know how to prepare blood agar? Blood agar paste plus 5 to 10 percent ships blood, prefer preferably. Human blood, yes, it can be can be done, but as much as possible, we do not want to use human blood in preparing for blood agar plate. You know why? Ah, uh, no. The reason why, because sometimes human blood could be inhibitory. That's the most important reason, particularly if that human where you get the blood sample from is taking antibiotics. It could be inhibitory, which will result into false negative culture. So, we can, they could easily grow on blood other plate and thioglycolate, but if heavily contaminated, we can use the following selective medium. Number one in our list would be mannitol salt agar, which I think you are all familiar with, followed by the CNA. So the one that you can see here is the CNA, the Columbia cholestine nalidixic agar. They will have a white colony. And then this one is the phenyl ethyl alcohol agar, wherein they will produce black colonies. Manitol salt agar, if the organisms are able to grow here, what's the composition? Manitol salt agar has 10% sodium chloride, manitol as the fermenting carbohydrates, phenol red as an indicator. That's why manitol salt agar. The organisms, staph aureus, and other staphylococcus species are what? They are halophilic, which means that they're able to tolerate 10% sodium chloride. Unlike other bacteria, they will not be able to grow in MSA because of its very high salt content. But if the organisms are able to ferment mannitol, it will produce golden yellow colonies because of the female red indicator. One of the products of fermentation is acid. And once the medium turns acidic, female red is converted to yellow. So there would be a yellow colony. So if the organisms are non manitol fermenters such as epidermidis, the manitol salt agar turns pink because the medium is not acidic. But if the organisms are manitol fermenters such as stuff or use, the medium turns yellow because the medium becomes acidic. So that's the principle behind the manitol salt agar. So this is a perfect yellow, golden yellow colonies, stuff or use seen under manitol salt agar. Usually, we have, uh, when I do experiment here in the lab, what I usually do, um, this contest known as Pagdamihan ng Libag. So I have a sterile swab, immersed in sterile water, and then I ask students to I would ask students to swab any areas of the skin which they think will have stuff. Some of them is, yeah, in the axilla, sa kilikile, sa foot, everywhere. And then, you'll be able to see if you're stricken in blood agar plate, beta hemolysis. That's one candidate for stuff. And then in MSA, sometimes you'll see pink colonies, sometimes you see yellow. If there are many yellow colonies, it means that you have many stuff or use in your skin, and you want the contest. Contest known as the Libag King and Queen. Let's do that! Let's do the Libag King and Queen and award the prize during the Medtech Day, no? <laughs> How do I identify Staphylococcus? 
You know the difference between stuff and strap aside from aside from the what you call this aside from the morphology catalyst test. Streptococcus is usually catalyst negative. So the principle of the test is that where the catalyst enzyme converts or hydrolyzed hydrolyzed hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. The very fact that oxygen is present will cause rapid effervescence of gas. And that's the positive reaction in the catalyst test. So, bubbling or the positive or the rapid effervescence of gas or the rapid effervescence of gas is the is the positive reaction for the catalyst test. So, because of the oxygen content. If there is no rapid effervescence of gas, that's negative. Strep and other lactic acid bacteria cannot generate oxygen out of the catalyst enzyme. So, they are considered as negative. Okay, so, use as hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. So, anyhow, um, this is an example of a positive reaction. Catalyst positive, catalyst negative. Procedure, uh, you get a slide and you add hydrogen peroxide. You add bacterial colony into hydrogen peroxide. If it's a stuff, the moment that you place the inoculating loop, okay, there would immediately be rapid effervescence of gas if it's positive. If there's there is no rapid effervescence of gas, provided that your H202 is not yet expired, huh? then there won't be any bubbles. But the thing is, if you are doing a catalyst test, a very important reminder, do not get colonies. Do not get colonies from where? What type of agar? Yes, do not get colonies from blood agar plate. Why? Because blood agar plate has naturally a cat blood has catalyst enzyme naturally. So if you're using colonies from blood agar plate, this will result into false positive. Everything will be positive. That's why, Diva, the best way to remove blood stain from your lab gown or from your skirt girls would be by applying it with hydrogen peroxide because blood has naturally a catalyst. Coagulase. Um, there are two types of coagulase. It could be cell bound or free. When you say cell bound, this one is a clamping factor which um, could clamp human, rabbit, or pig plasma. So if you want to check for the presence of the cell bound coagulase, you can do the slide method. So all you have to do is to mix the organism with a small amount of rabbit plasma, and then you check if clamping is present. The plasma causes clamping, then that's considered to be a, a positive reaction. If it's negative, then you have to do the tube method because 5% don't produce cell bound coagulase because the tube method will measure the free coagulase. When you say free coagulase, the enzyme is not bound to any cell. So, the extracellular free coagulase means that uh, the extracellular enzyme secreted that clots the plasma. And this can be done by using the tube method. Here, all you have to do is to aspirate about 0.5 ml of the plasma. So you aspirate about 4.5 ml of the plasma. So you have the plasma here. And then you add the bacteria. And then after 4 hours of inoculation and 24 hours after, you have to check the result to avoid false negative. Why? If you go beyond 
24 hours or if you go below 24 hours, uh, before 4 hours, there's a chance that you produce false negative result. Why? At first, the organism will, uh, will produce coagulase. What will happen if the organism produces coagulase? So, plasma will clot. 24 hours after, after producing coagulase, the organism will the organism will now produce staphylokinase. What is the action of staphylokinase? The action of staphylokinase is that if previously you have a clotted plasma, staphylokinase will remove the clot and plasma remains to be liquid or would go back to its liquid state. Which means, if you go beyond 24 hours, pag tinatagal mo yung coagulase sa incubator more than 24 hours, it becomes negative. But it's a false negative. Therefore, not anymore accurate. What enzyme is responsible for a false negative? Staphylokinase. Coagulase test is considered as the hallmark test for Staphylococcus aureus. You know why? Because it's considered as the single pathogenic test for Staphylococcus aureus. Because only staph among the human pathogens, only Staphylococcus aureus would be positive for coagulase test. Epidermidis saprophyticus, they are negative for, for coagulase test. So, other stuff can produce positive, usually do not exhibit the same colony morphology. Uh, can we use serum in coagulase test? Can we use serum? For coagulase test? No. Oh, we cannot use serum because serum, no matter how long you wait, will not cause coagulation because there's no more fibrinogen in serum. So we can all use plasma. Not just any kind of plasma, but you have to use ideally citrated plasma. It's preferably coming from the rabbit. So this is an example of a coagulase positive tube. Becomes gel. This is an example of a coagulase negative tube. Remains liquid. And aside from that, it's kind of turbid also. As compared to this one. Negative, positive. So, as you can see, Staphylococcus aureus is the only human pathogen that can cause positive reaction. The rest are what? The rest are animal pathogens. Sa mga kabayo, katabaw. So, we don't have this. And these are the coagulase negative. So, they, are also, they also have several groups. Epidermidis group. Saprophyticus, Simulans, Intermediate, Shuri, Hyacus, and Unspecified. We call them as the CONS or the Coagulase Negative Staphylococci. Um, Bacitrogen test is one of the tests that will allow us to differentiate Staphylococcus from Micrococcus. Micrococcus luteus produces yellow color, lemon yellow color. Um, they do not produce acid. Okay. And they are said to be sensitive to bacitracine. 
whereas the coagulase negative stuff would be resistant. Okay, so that's one way of differentiating micrococcus from CONS. If it's a urine sample, how, how do we identify CONS? If it's a urine sample, most likely it could be saprophyticus. You do the novobiosin. If it's sensitive, it's epidermidis. If it's resistant, then it is saprophyticus. So this is an example of novobiosin sensitivity testing. So this is saprophyticus and this is epidermis because of this zone of inhibition. We also have a rapid ID test. You do not want, you're, you do not have time, you do not have time to do coagulase tube method for plasma because you have to wait. So there are several slide, staphylo slide, serodyne color slide, staphorex. This is an example of staphorex. So here, uh, if there's an agglutination, this is considered as a positive. Bactista, plasma coated care particles, which could detect, by the way, both the clumping factor and the protein A. So, this is the algorithm on how do we differentiate Staphylococcus okay, from strep catalyst test. If it's positive, then it's staph. Negative, yes, yeah, strep. Then you do the coagulase test. If it's positive, or use. You do the oxidase, oxidase or bacitracine. If it's positive, micrococcus, which means it's sensitive. It's resistant, then it's CONS. Then you do the novobiosin. If sensitive, it's it's actually CONS, but most likely epidermidis. But if it's resistant, then saprophytes. And please go to table 14-3 of your Mihon book. And this will show you the different key identification for other species of Staphylococcus. Okay, for antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, we have, if, if the organisms are non-beta lactamase, penicillin could be used. However, here's the bad news. Sorry for Alexander Fleming, but 85 to 90% of staff or use are penicillin resistant. Penicillin resistant. Okay, why? Because of the beta lactamase. Beta lactamase is an enzyme that destroys the beta lactam release of penicillin. And so you always perform susceptibility testing, especially in serious infection. Nowadays, the problem becomes the MRSA. Um, or if it's epidermidis, it's MRSE. Okay? Important for infection control. So that's the reason why if you're a medical technologist, it's very important that you have PPE. You use uh, gloves, mask, goggles, contact isolation, and then of course, hand washing, basic thing. But most of us tend to forget it. And then, the treatment for MRSA is vancomycin. And we usually use cefosicin disc for the screening of MRSA. But usually, PCR would be the best method. It's a gold standard for detecting the MEK-A gene. So a MEK-A gene would have banned at 533 base pair. So if MEK-A is present, so it means that that person has MRSA. So that sample is positive for the MEK-A gene. Here's another problem. 
the Virsa. So, vancomycin is the the solution for MRSA, but some patients also develop the Virsa. So, or the Visa, vancomycin intermediate, which happens newly discovered in 2002. Um, and some of them develop the microlide resistance. They become developed to clean the mycin. Um, erythromycin and clintamycin should have the same resistant patterns, but usually um, they are not obvious unless you perform the D test. The D test uh, uses erythromycin and clindamycin disc. So there's a growth between the disc, but not on the side of clindamycin. Why? Because the organisms are clindamycin resistant. So here's here's erythromycin. Okay, here's clindamycin. So positive for D test because it appears to be like letter D. Okay, so so again, uh, here's the schema on how we differentiate uh, the different gram-positive bacteria.